Welcome to our live stream. This is Digital Jeff coming at you. Uh, we are going to spend the next few minutes uh, worshiping together and praying together and hearing the word preached together. Uh, it's not as good as gathering together as a community, but it's the next best thing in these difficult times. So we're excited about this. Let's go. Welcome here to Northview Community Church. We're so delighted that you chose to join us and watching on your computer, your TV, wherever you may happen to be watching this. As you can tell, things are a little bit different here. And so we have Northview TV that we've launched. And we're so excited to have our Downs Road people watching, people in Mission, our East Abbotsford campus. And we know there's a bunch of people watching from Real Life Community Church. And so we're so thankful that you're joining us. And those of you who are maybe new to Northview, you've never ever tuned into us before or been here for a service. We're so glad you're here. Like I said, it's going to be a little different because of everything that's going on in our world right now. And so let me give you just a quick outline of what's going to happen. Andrew's going to come up and he's going to lead us with the band in a few worship songs. I encourage you to sing along and join in. And even if you're at work, just stand up and start worshiping or whatever you need to do. Pray you just have a great time with that. Then we have a few of our pastors are going to be giving um, some messages. And so it's going to be an awesome time together. And I know you're going to want to take some pictures of where you're watching this. In fact, we'd love if you would do that. And if you would mark that with a hashtag, Northview TV, and then tag Northview Downs Road so we can all see those pictures together. We think this will be a kind of fun thing to be able to do. But before we start off with the rest of the service here, we want to include the children. So we've asked Pastor Dwight to put together a lesson at the very beginning here, just a short lesson for our children. So here it is. Hey boys and girls, Pastor Dwight here. For the next little bit, this is how we're going to be doing church. This is how you're going to get your Bible lesson, which means you get to stay at home in your pajamas, eating your cereal while still learning about Jesus. Last week, we talked about how Jesus gave Peter a very important job to do, which, and Jesus says to him, if you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. Remember three times Jesus says to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. And for us, how we show that we love Jesus, well, it's by loving the people in our lives that is sometimes hard to love. Maybe there's a boy or girl in your class that keeps taking your stuff. You love them. Maybe there's a boy or girl on your hockey team or your soccer team or your dance class that keeps bullying you. We love them. And when we, when we love those difficult people, we show Jesus that we love him. I also told you guys that Jesus is that one thing that we don't get to hang on for ourselves. Jesus is that one thing that we have to share with other people because just like we know and love Jesus, other people need to know and love Jesus as well. In today's video, we're going to learn a little more about how we do that and what it looks like to share Jesus with others. So take a look at this video and I'll be right back. After Jesus had been raised from the dead, he met with his disciples over the next 40 days. During that time, Jesus told them even more about God's kingdom. Then Jesus' 11 disciples went to a mountain in Galilee. Jesus had told them to go there. When the disciples saw Jesus, some of them worshiped him, but some of the disciples still doubted. Then Jesus went up to them and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus is God the Son. He always had authority. But after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, God gave him all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus is the king over all creation and he rules over God's kingdom. Jesus gave the disciples and everyone who follows him a job to do. He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of people from every nation. A disciple is a follower. Jesus wants his followers to tell people all over the world how to be rescued from sin and death by trusting in Jesus' death and resurrection. Then those people who believe would become disciples of Jesus too. Jesus also said, Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. New disciples are cleansed from sin by Jesus' blood. When believers are baptized, 
They show the world that they have turned away from sin and trusted in Jesus as their Savior. Jesus continued, Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Disciples who love Jesus will want to obey him. Then Jesus said, Remember this, I am always with you until the very end of the age. The good news about what Jesus has done to rescue us from our sins is too great to keep to ourselves. Before Jesus went back to heaven, he gave the disciples a job to do. Jesus wants his followers to teach people everywhere about Jesus so they will trust in him as their Lord and Savior. So boys and girls, like you just saw the video about how Jesus commands us to share his good news with everybody everywhere. Now you're thinking, but Pastor Dwight, I am just in the third grade. How am I supposed to share Jesus with everybody everywhere? Well, it starts with just one person. So let's say this is you. And you decide to share Jesus with that boy, that girl in your class that's bullying you. And guess what? They decide to follow Jesus. And what do they do? Well, they tell somebody else about Jesus. And that person also decides to follow Jesus. And they tell somebody who also decides to love Jesus. And they keep telling others about Jesus. They keep sharing the good news of Jesus with others. And it keeps going and going. And Jesus' good news now is gone viral has gone everywhere. Why? Because you took the time to share Jesus with one person. And that's what it looks like to take Jesus' good news and spread it across the world. It just starts with one person. Pick that person in your class or in your school. Love you guys. Pastor Dwight out. Look, we want to spend some time singing together this weekend, lifting up the name of our Lord Jesus. Wherever you are at home at the office, I want to encourage you, sing with us, lift up your voice, lift up your praises to him. Let's start by reading from 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Read about the greatness of our God. It says, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. Let's worship our God together.
Pastor Jesse Schellenberg from our mission campus here today. He's gonna come and bring an encouraging word for you. I pray that it would bless your heart today. To those of you listening online and to the few brave souls that are out here, uh, this is weird, but we're gonna roll with it and see how it goes. Uh, let's jump into scripture together. We live in a world filled with people who have troubled hearts. People whose hearts are, are filled with fear, and for good reason. We have uh, markets, stock markets that, that are crashing. We have, we have savings accounts that are being depleted. We have borders that are being closed. We have airports that, that, aren't, that aren't functioning anymore. We have schools being shut down. We have a virus that's spreading all over this planet. There's good reasons for people to have troubled hearts and to be afraid right now. Jesus looked into the eyes of his disciples on the night before he would be arrested and tried and eventually killed. And he noticed that they had troubled hearts. Here's what he said to them. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. There's two things about Jesus' peace that we learn from this. Number one, it's not like the world's. Jesus' peace is different. See, the, the peace that, that the world gives is a peace that is uh, contingent on us being in control of the circumstances. Right, so think of things like, like insurance, uh, things like uh, having a stable government and other things so that when, when the world goes crazy or things uh, start to, to fall apart, we feel like we're in control because we have these things like, like insurance or healthcare, and we're, we should be grateful for these things. These are good things. That's why world leaders right now are standing up and, and looking in the eyes of, of their citizens and, and of the public, and they're saying, it's okay. Relax. Don't freak out. We got this. We're all under control. And yet it certainly doesn't seem like that, does it? See, Jesus says that the peace that I'm offering you, disciples, is not like that. It's not a peace that, that gives you control of the circumstances. So what type of peace does Jesus give? The peace that Jesus gives is a peace that only comes when we realize we're not in control. That, that sounds crazy. Even just saying it, I, I feel like that sounds ridiculous. And it does, and the Bible says that it, that it will sound ridiculous to e you, our ears. So let me, let me illustrate it a little bit. It was one time uh, I was helping my dad do some uh, a construction job, and we were at the end of it. We had been kind of renovating this, this kitchen, and the, the new cabinets were in, the new flooring was in. It was all done except the kitchen sink. I just had to put in the kitchen sink. My dad had to officiate a, a funeral. So, so there I am on my own, and I was ready to go because I'd watched a couple YouTube videos. Uh, I was going to install this kitchen sink all on my own. I'm there. I had everything laid out. I'm ready to rock. All right, let, let's turn off the water. So I go under the sink and I turn the water and psh, water just starts spraying everywhere. So I'm freaking out, trying to block it. It's like, hey, I gotta find the main water shut off. So I run into the hot water room and uh, where the hot water tank is and I'm looking and I can't find it anywhere. So I run back and water's everywhere. It's starting to like billow out of the cabinets now and I'm, I'm starting to freak out. And it was, it was in one of those uh, like multiplexes and then this was the top one. And so I go down to like the neighbor below and I'm like, hey, knocking on the door, where is, like, wh where is this shut off? And, and I can't find it. And, and, and it was like a retirement complex and so it was, a very slow pace of this gentleman, and, and he's, he's, I don't know, maybe it's over here, and he didn't help. He's like, well, call Henry across the way. He's kind of our facilities guy, and so I run over to Henry's house, and, and Henry slowly gets there, and uh, Henry's like, well, let me call Bill. Hey, Bill, how you doing? I'm like, people, like there's a flood happening. Let's go here, and, and, and finally, I meet this, this guy in this weird shed, and I, he gives me this like 20 foot long pipe and he's like yeah go into the middle of Gladwin Road and remove the manhole and like turn off the water to the entire complex and I'm like no people this is not what I need I just need to turn off the water but I tried it anyway I'm stopping traffic and like trying to turn off the water I can't figure it out and I finally just run back into this uh, place and, and I open the door and there's water coming down the staircase at this point and I get back into the kitchen and I didn't know what to do there was water was absolutely everywhere I open the window and just start bailing like I'm on a ship I did that for a while, and then finally I heard the door open, and I heard someone run up the stairs, and I look up, and there's my dad. And he's standing there, and I'm sure he's observing the situation, like, this is not what I asked you to do. But the thing he did was he came over to me, ankle deep in water, and gave me a hug. 
It's, it's going to be okay. See, in that moment, I had a troubled heart. But what gave peace to my troubled heart was to know that my dad was there and everything was going to be okay. See, the, the peace that Jesus gives us is not a peace that the world gives. He, he doesn't give us control of our circumstances, but he gives us access to the one who is in control of every circumstance. And the good news is that this God, if we are in Christ, he loves us. See, no, no matter what's going on, no matter how ankle deep or knee deep or neck deep we are in the water of what this world is throwing at us, God is in control and, and he loves us. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in, in Romans, he says, what can separate us from this love? Can, can famine or, or hardship or life or death or angels or demons or the present or the future or any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So friends, take heart that Jesus on the night he was going to be betrayed looked at his disciples. He had compassion on them and he said, peace be with you. My peace I give to you, not as this world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a God who is in control. And Father, it's in times like these where our, our beliefs are tested. And so Father, I ask by the power of your spirit that you would give us the faith and the trust that you are in control and that you love us. Father, I thank you that the peace that you offer is not based off of what is happening in this world, but is based off of the fact that you're sovereign, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ. Father, give us access to you through faith in him. Father, I pray that as we worship with, with you and, and with others uh, through this online platform and as we continue to, to try to stay in community as a church, Father, that we wouldn't do it with fearful hearts. We wouldn't do it uh, out of anxiousness, Father, or distress, but we do it out of hope. Father, we do it with the peace that you give us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you're enjoying this so far. And you know, while I have your attention, just a quick thing I want to let you know of here. If you look underneath your screen and the bottom right, there's a button there that you can press to get the Northview newsletter. This is our way for you to be able to find out everything that's happening at Northview during the week. And so if you sign up for that, you'll get an email once a week and it has everything going on. And also, if you look to the left, there's a button there called Give. You can click on that button to give to Northview at any time, and it's all done through your computer. But you can also text to give. And you can text the number that's on the screen right now, and it's a very simple, easy way to be able to do that.
Well, what a week. This week, uh, for me anyway, began with uh, this virus, COVID-19, affecting um, countries like Italy and China and South Korea. I remember hearing stories about how bad it was in northern Italy and being thankful, of course, that that was a long way across the earth from where we were. Never thinking, of course, that this is going to affect all of us in all the ways that, that it has. Uh, the week ended with the NBA being canceled, the NHL being canceled, the English Premier League being canceled, the Masters being canceled, national borders are shut down, churches are canceled across the world, and many of us are waiting hours and hours on the phone with Delta Airlines. So as those who follow Jesus, how should we think about all this? There's a, there's a passage in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 2. We as a church, we studied Romans recently, and so this is a little bit fresh on our minds. Romans 12, 2, a very famous verse, it says, do not, be, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Of course, we made the point in the past, and we make it now, that there are two different ways that you can view the world. You can view it through the lens that the world currently has, right? The pattern of this age or the pattern of this world. And you can view the world through the pattern of God, testing and approving what the will of God is with a renewed mind. This is the way, the second way, is the way that Christians ought to view things. So we, we don't just follow along with everybody else in the culture. We don't just step in line with the way that they think about things necessarily, we instead put on the glasses of Scripture and we ask the question, how should we then think about the things that are happening around us? So what I want to do in the next few minutes is I want to put those glasses on. I want to act like a person with a renewed mind, like a pastor with a renewed mind, and I want to address some of the things that we're facing, some of the thinking that we're facing, some of the questions that we have, and I want to take the Bible and use it to address those. So I have four biblical and pastoral reflections along these lines, all right? So here's the first of them. Let's obey our government, number one. Um, as I said, uh, some of us are on the phone with Delta Airlines. Uh, that was a real thing that happened to us just the other day, two hours of listening to that horrible music being played in the background, and finally somebody coming on and saying, hello, how can I help you? And me giving praise to our Lord Jesus for the fact that they actually answered. We were on the phone for another hour because we were trying to sort all sorts of things out. They'd been fantastic. They were wonderful. Yay, Delta. Hashtag Delta. But... I was really disappointed, and I have been really disappointed. Uh, it, it has been cold where we live. It's been rainy where we live. Uh, I struggle with mental health in the wintertime, so I've been longing to go somewhere where the sun will shine, warm on my skin, and so Palm Desert was, was the place. It was my oasis. And now all of a sudden, because of this pandemic, my plans have been completely ruined. We thought, well, maybe we'll still do it anyway, right? Right? So the government came out and they said, you need to take this 14-day uh, quarantine. If you go out of the country, you can do it. But if you go out of the country and you come back, you have to take 14 days. And of course, my first response to that was, how do they know? Right? Why don't we just lie about it? You know, we'll go, we'll come back. And when I, they look at my tanned face, I'll say, Langley is lovely this time of year. Right? But then... You know, the Bible gets in the way of these kinds of thinking. Romans 13, verse 1, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And in my, my spirit, I'm like, yeah, but... You don't obey the government all the time. Just because they've instituted a rule doesn't mean you always have to obey it. I mean, look at the Bible. Look at the Hebrew midwives. When the Pharaoh said you should kill all the Hebrew children, the Hebrew midwives didn't do it. You know, they were standing up for justice. So I don't always need to obey the government. 
But then, of course, the question comes up, is it really unjust for the government to protect health and safety of the most vulnerable among us by requiring us to self-quarantine if we travel out of the country? Is it really unjust for them to ask us not to meet in groups of 250 or more? No. In fact, it's quite just. And to rebel against the government is to rebel against God in these cases. So look, let's begin by making a a commitment together as Christian people that we are going to pray for and we are going to obey our leaders. Second reflection, um, behold our frailty. So I was reading a couple weeks ago, as God's providence would have, uh, about... um, the SpaceX commercial flights that are going to be taking place. SpaceX is the company uh, by the guy who created Tesla, I think. And anyway, they, they are going to shoot up into uh, the heavens, this new, um, basically, space shuttle. They've, they've configured it so that they can actually take commercial passengers up there. And so in this article in, in the website Engadget, Mariella Moon, she wrote, while we haven't seen the Starship, that's the name of the spaceship they're going to use for commercial flights, while we haven't seen the Starship fly yet, SpaceX just got done with its test firings and short hops last April. We might not have to wait long for its first commercial flight. According to SpaceX Vice President Jonathan Hofeller, the company is hoping to send its it send this spaceship to space for its first commercial mission in 2021. So if you're interested in doing this, you need to set aside 55 million US dollars and you too could fly up into orbit and, and come back down. It's probably a pretty good use of 55 million if you've got it lying around. But when I read this, I thought to myself, aren't human beings amazing? Like we, we can make rockets that carry people like me into space now. We can take a plane, shoot it up into space, and Star Trek our lives if we want. Through technology, we've come to believe in the modern world that we can basically solve every problem. Is there an issue that is raised in our society that we can't address by applying good scientific reasoning to it? We are undaunted by the things that stand in our way. We as human beings believe that we can overcome any obstacle through the application of the right technology. Until along comes this little tiny virus with little spikes on it. It's passed from animal to human in China, and then it spreads, and eventually it's in Italy and here, and we're all locked down in our houses, and the stock market crashes. Behold the truth. We are a frail people. This shouldn't come as a shock to you if you're a Christian. Psalm 103, verse 15, the life of mortals is like grass. They flourish Like a flower of the field, the wind blows over it and it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. That image of humans being like grass that a hot wind comes on and just dries out just reminds me of every July where we live and how quickly my lawn turns turns brown. We live in the wettest place in the world. And yet it takes like a week of hotness to turn my grass brown. I can barely remember when it was green. And that's really what the psalmist is saying here. We are like that mist that appears for a little while and then it it vanishes. All it takes is a good hot wind and we wither. And that's the true nature of human beings. We, We have been made by God as the crowning glory of his creation. We are made in his image. No other creature on the world is like that, but... We are also completely dependent on his grace to protect us from harm. We are so very frail. So what should be happening in our minds is not what my friend 
told me the other day, he's very frustrated with the fact that God has permitted the coronavirus to happen because it's interrupted all of our plans and done all these things and, of course, killed lots of people. He's like, what is God doing? And in response, I said to him, instead of thinking it that way, perhaps you should start thinking, why is it that God has always protected us from stuff like this? Isn't it amazing that through all these ages, God in his common grace has provided for Christians and unbelievers alike through the application of his science in the world that he made, that we have antibiotics and we have all sorts of other things that prohibit these things from ultimately coming at us. That is a grace of God. That is a grace of God. Because we are very frail. Third one, third musing or reflection, um, I've already kind of mentioned it. Uh, Providence, God's providence, often interrupts our plans. I don't need to tell you that. Your plans have been totally interrupted. My my friend, I remember back when I was in college and I had a friend named Joe, and uh, he was played for the football team in my university. And uh, I remember he broke his, his leg in four places or something, trying to make a block downfield. He went into the hospital, and the doctors told him, as they've told lots of other sportsmen and sportswomen over the ages, uh, this injury that you've sustained will mean that you can no longer play your sport. Joe, of course, was... Ruined. He, he had visions of playing in the NFL. He had desire all, you know, like to do, to be the, one of the greatest. He remember Tim talking to me about the Hall of Fame at one point, which was not going to happen. But he, you know, you can have dreams. And now here he is sitting in a hospital bed or laying in a hospital bed and he's got his leg in traction and he's left there in the quiet to think about all the dashed dreams and hopes that he had. And of course, his question is the same question that you and I ask Whenever something like this happens, whenever God's providence gives us a left turn when we wanted to go right, the question we ask is, why would God do this? Why does he disrupt our plans? I've I've actually come to realize that this is the most pressing issue for, for us. That if you can talk to people long enough and get behind the, the face that they put on or the mask that they wear, what you'll end up realizing is that they have questions on why it is their life has not turned out the way that they had planned it. We get very frustrated when God doesn't enable our plans. But it's not something that the Bible doesn't talk about, this left turn where you wanted to go right. In fact, James chapter 4, listen to these verses, James 4, 13, just listen. It's like, it's like James has looked into the future and in 2020, in the month of March, sat down and watched the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic take place. He says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Oh, we have been, we boast. (laughs) This is gonna happen. I'm gonna go play here. I'm gonna go and, and, and build this. I'm gonna go and make money. I'm gonna go and... Yada, 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 yada. And ultimately, this whole thing is shown once again that the Lord has the right to do things his way. And we get angry with him. There are actually three responses, I think, to when this, this happens. One of the responses that we can have is to walk away. God, if you're going to do that to me, I am done with you. Okay, you and I, we're not getting along anymore. In fact, I'm going to say that you don't even exist. That's how angry I am at you. So I go do my own thing. It doesn't matter if I was a Christian in the past. It doesn't matter how much I sang the songs in the past. I'm going my own way. The other option is to stay with God. You might even be a churchgoer, but you stay bitterly, right? You go to church and you smile at all the people around you, but inside, you're so upset. 
You're so angry at God. You're almost thinking to yourself, if I can go to church enough, maybe he'll change his mind. If I can go to church enough and sing the songs and show him that I'm a good boy or a good girl, then he's actually going to come around in the end. But inside, the reason you're doing it is because you're mad at him. You stay, but you remain bitter. And then there's the third way. We trust him. You basically say, listen, I recognize that my perspective on things is limited. I am frail. I don't have the right to boast. God knows better. And ultimately, he has promised me through a covenant that he will take care of me. He will bring me to the destination he desires for me. And that destination will be better than I had ever imagined for myself. So, Lord... Let it be to me as you have said. I guarantee you that that's the approach that Jesus urges you to take. The whole Bible is screaming at us to open our hands and to be willing to follow wherever he leads. Here's my last one. Ultimately, what should we think about all this? Um, we should remember that we're a people of hope. In fact, that's the thing I think that defines Christians. Lots of things define Christians, but more than anything else, we are people of ridiculous, energetic, profound hope. You remember the scene, if you've read your Bibles before, maybe through the book of Acts, you see in Acts 16, uh, Paul and Silas, these missionaries are in the city of Philippi, and there's this demon-possessed girl that's following them around, saying, yelling out a whole bunch of things. And Paul finally gets tired of it. He turns around and he tells her, you know, demon, come out of her. And of course, she's healed. The problem is, of course, that this, this girl had what they called the spirit of Python. She could tell the future. And there were lots and lots of pimps, basically, who were using her to try to get some money, right? Somebody would come in and they'd pay the money like she was going to do her tarot cards and some of what she said about the future came true and so they could make a lot of money off of her but now they can't because the demon's gone. So they raise a fuss in the city and they say, these men who've been saying these horrible things about, you know, against our gods, proclaiming there's only one God, we should oppose them. And they rile up the city and they get the local magistrates to grab Paul and Silas. They beat them and then they put them in prison. In fact, they put them in the inner prison in stocks. Stocks are, of course, these wood, uh, basically tire irons. But they don't move around like a tire iron does. You, you just sit on your rear end and your feet go through the stocks and you're locked in there. Roman prisons were not known for their cleanliness, nor were they known for their comfort. So there they are, basically in a hole in the ground with their feet stuck in a couple pieces of wood, Paul and Silas. And in Acts 16, verse 25, you read the most remarkable verse, perhaps, in much of the New Testament. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. What? I, they're praying and, and singing hymns to God while they're in a Roman prison. They've just been beaten. And there, there they are in the middle of this Roman prison, singing praises to the Lord. I complain about hangnails. But they sing praises. Why? Why do you think they sing praises? Like if you go across the way Paul talks about his life and many of his other letters, the reason becomes very apparent. The reason that Paul can praise in the midst of the greatest heartache he's got is because he believes that God is achieving his purposes regardless of the present circumstances. That God, even through those circumstances, is going to bring about his desired end. And because Paul is confident in that end, he can rejoice when it doesn't look like the end is coming. My wife and I were watching the movie A Quiet Place the other, the other week. A uh, Quiet Place is about uh, uh, a world where an alien creature comes down and it hears sounds. So everyone has to be completely quiet. And if you make any noise at all, they'll come and eat you. Uh, great premise for a movie. I love monster movies. And so this was, we were sitting down. My wife kept 
sitting next to me, and, and I'd seen it before on an airplane, and so I knew, I knew it was going to come in the ending, and she kept asking me questions about it all the time. Is this going to die? Is he going to win? Is he going to lose? Is he going to whatever? And she's like freaking on the edge of her seat. I don't want to watch it to the end if this is going to be have everyone die. And I realized halfway through that here, here she is. She's feeling all the feels in the present moment, but because I'd seen the film before and I'd seen the beginning to the end, I'm sitting there giggling when the monster comes and eats the little boy, right? It's not, it's not a positive thing necessarily, but I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that my perspective on this is so different than hers. Why? Well, because I'm confident of the end. Are you confident of the end? You, you do know that the hero wins in the end, right? He returns and he makes everything right. His kingdom comes in the end. The rescue will succeed. So how should that affect you? Well, maybe it should make us sing. Maybe it should make us hope. Yes, now is a time for hope, not fear, but hope. God is working out his purposes perfectly. He's not surprised by this. And ultimately, he will be glorified in it, and we will see our good in it. So I'll leave with this. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Peter writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and sober, of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He wants you to freak out, you know. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you and I have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Let's take comfort in the sovereignty of our God and worship him together. Stand.
Well, as it's been acknowledged already, it's a little bit weird uh, to be doing this online, but uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, As Pastor Jeff said, we are uh, people of hope as Christians. So the question is, is how how should our knowledge of the end of the story, of the hope that we have, the the hope that we have in Christ, the, the big cosmic story that God is telling that all things will end up for our good, how should that actually motivate us to live today? Well, we find an answer for that question in John chapter 13, where Jesus says this, John 13, starting in verse 1, John writes, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. See, Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him. And then he served people. In humility, he washed their feet. So in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we as Christians should listen to the authorities and wash our hands. But we also need to follow our Lord's example and wash the feet of others. We should be serving those in our midst in humility. So let's, as Christians, take on a posture of our Lord and Savior and selflessly serve others. The the church has responded in history to pandemics in this kind of serving others in a sacrificial way. In the third century, there was a massive pandemic sweeping uh, Western civilization for over 10 years. And it got so significant that on the the worst days of the pandemic, 5,000 people died a day. And in the midst of that pandemic in the third century, the early church put aside their preferences didn't stockpile supplies for them and their own. Instead, they went out and served those who were dying. They followed the example of their Lord. They didn't just believe the gospel. They lived in light of the gospel in the midst of a pandemic. And what's crazy is that in that setting, God used that kind of countercultural, humble foot washing, serving of others to spark a revival of salvation in Western civilization. So many thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because his followers followed his example to wash the feet of those around them. So much so that actually the mass conversion sparked Emperor Julian about 100 years after the pandemic, and he was blaming the growth of Christianity on this. He said that it was the benevolence to strangers that led to the mass conversion. The emperor also said that it's a disgrace that the impious Galileans, the Christians, support not only their own poor, but ours as well. You see, God used the countercultural impulse to actually wash the feet of people who need our intervention and help in the midst of a pandemic to save thousands. And in the midst of this pandemic, the reality is, is that the church is already responding to those being affected by COVID-19. I know this personally. This past week on Tuesday, uh, my wife got a phone call from someone we know who was quite ill. Uh, My wife is a very kind person. I told her she should call the ambulance and let the ambulance take care of it. Uh, My wife said, no, I need to be there to help this person in need. So she showed up. She left our home. She drove to a different city in the Fraser Valley. She went to that place. She wasn't able to help this person. They were in such a dire need that they ended up calling the ambulance. When the ambulance took this person that we know into the hospital, it was 
at that point, because of a variety of other things in, in the past few weeks and the testing that this person already had, that their health was confirmed to actually be positive for the COVID-19. And Sarah, my wife, was exposed to it, which meant that instead of coming home that night, she went into quarantine, and she's still there. So we have had Christians in the midst of the pandemic, putting aside their preferences and serving us. See, when you know the person around you that is facing the trial, you want to help. There might even be an impulse in you right now to say, I should send Greg an email and see if he needs help. We're we're well taken care of. But there are people in your midst who don't have the same kind of access to a community that I have. That same empathy that you felt in you that was driving you to want to text or email me should actually be mobilized to wash the feet of the people in your midst. See, Christians respond this way in the midst of pandemics. We put aside our preferences and we serve the other. And maybe, just maybe, God will use this season to do it again. How in the third century, Christians gave up of their preferences. They didn't stockpile for them and their own. Instead, they selflessly served those around them. And because of their instinct and proactive washing the feet of others, thousands might actually come to saving faith again. You know, we live in a culture where uh, our, our big gods, the big things that give us hope and joy, are money and health and autonomy and comfortability, and COVID-19 is stripping every single one of those things away. People are desperate for a God who can deliver. We serve a God who can deliver. Our world is sick and broken, and in this season, we as the church should rise up to humbly serve others. We need to bring people to Jesus, the great physician, and we need to tell them the news that will bring their eternal healing. See, in our our culture, our neighbors might be contemplating the fragility of life for the first time in a very long time. The apathy that they have towards spiritual things and towards God might actually be chipping away in their own heart. Maybe, just maybe, they're ready to hear about some hope and some good news in Jesus. And maybe we can tell them that news as we're by their feet washing them in this time of need. I'm praying that God would remove from all of us our shyness of speaking about the goodness of Jesus and the hope of the gospel in this season. I'm praying that we would be people who live in light of our hope, that we would be people who follow the example of our Lord, that we would wash the feet of those around us. Because we're people of hope because we know the big cosmic story that God is telling and we know that Jesus is victorious in the end. And even though we are not promised to go untouched by this pandemic, we know the end of the story and we know along with the hymnist that this is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that you would reach down into this pandemic and you would bring healing. Lord, would you be present with each and every person who is fighting this horrific illness? Would you give doctors wisdom? Would you open up respirators for those who need it? Would you help those in quarantine fight the loneliness? Would you help those of us who are still healthy to not be worried about our own health, but that we would be focused on how we could serve others and make you look big in this season? Father, we ask for you to move and have a revival come across this country of people coming to saving faith in Jesus. Lord, do this for your fame. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us here at Northview through Northview TV this weekend. We're so encouraged that you were part of this with us. On this page, there's a link to our YouTube channel. We'd love for you to uh, link up to that, subscribe to our YouTube so that you can see all the different content that we have there. And throughout the week, we're going to be adding more and more content onto there. So make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to have a great week this week. And if you have any issues that you'd like to talk about, um, you can email care at norfew.org, and there's people that would love to spend some time chatting with you about whatever you may be going through. So thanks for being with us this week. Please come back next week. Have a great week.